talk a little bit about that. For people who might not know his story, uh, you know, he he comes from a military family, and uh, but he, he he graduated from the military academy almost at the bottom of his class. He wasn't sort of a stellar <laughs> student at all. Uh, but when he went to Vietnam, he wasn't there very long before he cheated death once very quickly, and then shortly after that became a prisoner of war. Can you talk a little about a little bit about that? Yeah, that, there, there was no guarantee that uh, any of those men were going to live. And uh, you'll remember Jeremiah Denton, when they were showing these propaganda movies to the world, uh, they were denying torture, and Jeremiah Denton blinked with his eyes in Morse code, torture. And that video was quietly shown in embassies around the world to verify that the North Vietnamese were indeed torturing these men. If you read the book, The Passing of the Night, a Random House book by uh, uh, Robinson, General Robinson Riser, it gives you an idea of the depth of the type of torture they went through. And there was every uh, likelihood that John McCain was going to die there, far away from the people that he loved. It was a real miracle how the war ended and those prisoners of war were rescued. And they didn't know, <laughs> they didn't know that the Americans still cared about them and were working to bring them home. So it's uh, uh, hard to imagine what they went through, but it's a great story of a, a very courageous man. Yeah, I just want to remind people of what we're watching right here. Um, the senator's body has left the Capitol building in Phoenix. It is heading to the North Phoenix uh, Baptist Church, where there will be a ceremony a little bit later on. Vice President Joe Biden will be speaking at, at that ceremony, along with Larry Fitzgerald, an Arizona Cardinals player. But also, uh, Vice President Dan Quayle will be there, 24 sitting uh, senators will be there, as well as four former senators and, of course, family members and friends of the McCain family. Um, after that, um, the body will be moving on, will be transported, and it's heading to uh, Washington, D.C. Um, but this is an opportunity over the past couple of days for the state of Arizona to say their final goodbyes to their uh, senator. Um, he has represented their state for decades. Thousands of people lined up. We're getting a number between 12 and 15,000 people walking past his uh, body in the uh, Capitol building uh, just to say goodbye, but also to share stories with each other. And at one point, some of his children arrived and they were able to say thank you to his children and talk about just how important he was to the state of Arizona, but also, also to them um, personally. So that's what we're watching right now the motorcade trend transporting the body of John McCain to the North Phoenix Baptist Church. And I'm talking to Doug Weed, historian, about the legacy of this great man. I just, you know, when I think of him, I just think of sort of the best definition of what we expect an American to be. Um, you know, you talked about when he was a prisoner of war. He had left behind a, a new wife, a young daughter at the time, and he did have an opportunity to jump in front of other Americans and come home before them, and he said no. Yeah, uh, he didn't do it. That's a pretty amazing moment. And Anne Marie, uh, remember, I reiterate this point. Uh, when he made that decision, there was every likelihood that he was signing his own death warrant at the time, and he knew it. But he wouldn't give the North Vietnamese that, even that small propaganda victory. And I think part of that was this experience he'd had with his father and his grandfather. It was a moment. A uh, transcendent moment where he suddenly became uh, every bit as good and as great as the men that he'd heard about all his life as a little boy. Yeah, this was a family that, for this family, service to country, but service to others was sort of the highest um, achievement. That's part of what military service was for John McCain. But then when there was no longer military service, he chose to serve this country as a politician. Can you talk a little bit about what service meant to him? Because, you know, people enter politics for all sorts of reasons now, some of them not so honorable, but it certainly seems like John McCain was driven by a desire to improve those around him, improve the lives of those around him. 
Yeah, I don't want to exaggerate that because he was a superb politician. And like all politicians to survive uh, in Washington, D.C., yeah, he had his favorite. Uh, uh, there were his fav the favorite corporations and the favorite lobbyists that he worked with. And he but he would often go against the grain mm -hmm. and uh, totally defy them and uh, take a different tack in that sense. Uh, his integrity would triumph over a, a very useful political uh, 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 chance uh, to improve his own standing. Mm -hmm. So it's something of a, a phenomena how he rose to the top uh, and ran for president twice and uh, almost won, almost became a president. Yeah, you had mentioned uh, the Keating Five. I think that, you know, when you look at his long career as a politician, there's sort of two areas that jump out as perhaps areas that he might have thought were missteps. Um, the saving and loan scandal with the Keating Five and Sarah, the choice of Sarah Palin as a vice president, Joel, uh, running mate. Um, but he learned a lot from the Keating Five. He was investigated, and it was determined that he uh, exhibited poor judgment, essentially. Can you talk a little bit about what that chapter in his political career meant to him and what he learned from it? Yeah, you know, Anne Marie, that's such a dramatic story, such a moving story to me that I actually talk about it to my children and my grandchildren. I use it as a life experience for them <laughs> uh, because the Keating Five, Keating went to prison of the five senators, three of their careers were absolutely cut short. Two others, and one of them being McCain, continued to survive and have a career. But his name was blackened. This this was fraud. This was a great controversy. It ruined the careers of many people all around uh, Keating. But John McCain carefully, laboriously, tediously, day by day, step by step, rebuilt his life back from the Keating Five scandal to become known, to become famous as a person of integrity, to the point that they called his bus during the presidential campaign the Straight Talk Express, <laughs> mm -hmm. to the point that he reached across the aisle and was the only one on the Republican side that could help the Democrats come up with a pro program to reform campaign finance. That is a marvelous moment. And I tell my children and I tell my grandchildren, when, some, when you do something wrong or something hurts you or you're perceived to have done something wrong, it isn't fatal. If you're not dead, <laughs> it's not fatal. And the great example of that is John McCain, who became the very opposite of what the story of the Keating Five seemed to say. <laughs> Definitely true. Uh, we played an interview with uh, Lindsey Graham a little bit earlier today that John Dickerson did, and uh, John asked him, Lindsey Graham, what Senator McCain would be saying to him right now, and he said Senator McCain would be saying, buck up, right? Um, that, uh, and, and also that you're embarrassing yourself. Um, <laughs> It's, uh, you mentioned, you know, one of the things that people say about him is that, that is refreshing about him as a politician is his ability to say, I made a mistake, I did something wrong, and, and then to attempt to, to, to correct it. I wonder how he felt about his two attempt, not that these were wrong, this is probably not going together poetically, but, um, you know, his two attempts to become the president, uh, first beaten sort of at the primary level by um, uh, George W. Bush and then later by Barack Obama, they must have been sort of disappointing moments for him. Did he ever speak about what those journey, what the journey of attempting to become the president meant to him, even in those losses? I uh, never talked to him about that, mm. but I n know how uh, bitter political campaigns can be. And you'll remember that George W. Bush, who's going to be here at the funeral, you know that George W. Bush's campaign ambushed him in South Carolina, yes. uh, said he was the father of a black child, said that he was a traitor, tried to pull out of context things that had happened in North Vietnam. And that was just like kicking John McCain in the stomach. That was it's one thing to take 
torture from uh, communists in Vietnam far from home who believe you've invaded their country and to be uh, hurt and have your bones broken and be tortured by them, something else to have a fellow in the same political party kick you in the stomach like that. Uh, but look, look who's speaking at his funeral is George W. Bush. So John McCain had the ability to forgive himself after Keating five and rebuild a career that proved that as an aberration. And he had the ability to forgive people who hurt him. Uh, in, in order to continue to do good things for America. Yeah, so much to learn uh, from the way the pre the, uh, the senator lived his life. Doug Weed, I want to thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Anne-Marie. Well, CBS News Chief Congressional Correspondent Nancy Cordes is at the North Phoenix Baptist Church where uh, today's service is being held. You're just outside there. We're sort of watching in a split screen, Nancy Cordes, the uh, motorcade heading your way. Uh, what's the scene like there where you are? Well, right behind me, Anne-Marie, you can see the military honor guard uh, waiting to receive that casket and carry it into the church where there are thousands, literally thousands of people who have already gathered, family, friends, constituents, members of the public have been invited in as well uh, to pay tribute to the man who represented this state for more than 35 years. Uh, here's a program as we await his arrival. Uh, it says John Sidney McCain, United States Senator, with a, a landscape of what we assume uh, would be Sedona, his beloved Sedona, the ranch where he passed away uh, several days ago. Uh, the program is quite extensive, and everything in it is very personally meaningful to John McCain himself. He hand-selected everyone he wanted to speak, everyone he wanted to hear from. Uh, for example, uh, after the welcome and invocation, we're going to hear a hymn from the Brophy Student Ensemble. This is the school that his two sons, uh, Jack and Jimmy, attended. So it's a school that the McCain family has been affiliated with for quite some time. A reading by his daughter, Bridget, uh, and a reading by his son, Andy McCain, as well. Uh, we haven't really had an opportunity to hear from the McCain children yet. We saw them, of course at that uh, very solemn ceremony at the Arizona State Capitol yesterday. Clearly, this is a family uh, that is grieving, and that's why it was uh, so surprising to see four of the McCain children come back to the Capitol late last night and thank people who had come to stand in line to see McCain as he was lying in state in the rotunda of the Arizona State Capitol. And he just shook hands and said hello to people who were very surprised um, when, when one of McCain's sons said, oh, well, actually, you know, it's great to hear what you think of him because I'm, I'm his son. And, um, you know, it was, it was uh, sort of heartwarming for everyone, I think, uh, both for uh, the constituents who were quite moved by the experience and also for uh, the members of his family who were uh, surely comforted by the fact that there were so many other people who, who loved him the way that they did. Indeed. Um, Vice President Joe Biden will be speaking. He knew the senator very well. Uh, any hint as to what the, the former vice president will be saying in his uh, remarks? You know, it's always hard to predict exactly what Joe Biden is going to say. Uh, and I think that this is no exception. Uh, what's interesting about their relationship is that they have been friends since they were both um, young men, since before John McCain even entered the Senate. Uh, he was the naval liaison to the Senate. And in that capacity, uh, he helped, worked with a young senator from Delaware named um, Joe Biden. And they actually traveled the world together on uh, military delegations. And that's how they first got to know one another. Then, of course, John McCain uh, married his wife, Cindy, moved to her home state of Arizona, ended up running in pretty short order for uh, the House. And then a few years later for the Senate, where then he, he rejoined his friend Joe Biden as a colleague. And they spent decades together, again, traveling, um, duking it out on the Senate floor, praising each other on the Senate floor. Uh, these are two people who have never had a problem uh, making friendships that cross party lines. And uh, so I think they had a similar sense of humor. They were both very gregarious. They both liked to have a good time. They both 
love to talk, <laughs> and uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure that they had a lot of time to talk about everything on those long foreign trips. So I think we'll hear some very interesting stories from Joe Biden today about their time together. And also somebody else speaking today, Larry Fitzgerald, and I think many people mm -hmm. might be surprised because it seems like an unlikely choice, but it's actually not. That's right. I mean, you know, uh, John McCain, what's so interesting about him is that he had friends from across the political spectrum and friends who had nothing whatsoever to do with politics. Larry Fitzgerald, wide receiver for the Arizona Cardinals for 13 seasons. Uh, John McCain was a big sports fan here in Arizona. He went to games all the time. And uh, so he asked Larry months ago if he would speak at this service. Uh, another interesting appearance at the service today is a Navajo flutist. His name is Jonah Little Sunday. Um, John McCain always made a special point of caring for the Native American community. And we saw Native Americans coming out in force at the state capitol yesterday to pay their respects for that very reason. He was on the Indian Affairs Committee. Uh, and so this was another one of his requests that, um, that Native American views and performances be incorporated into his memorial services this week. So that should be pretty meaningful as well. Yeah, that was very interesting. You know, it's just sort of briefly for a moment, um, the video feed that has been set up inside the church was running, and I think we might have seen the flutist playing, and then shortly after that, um, a gentleman with bagpipes. Completely different right. style of music. Um, <laughs> I, I, and he loved his bagpipes. He, he loved did? bagpipes, and actually, they are going there. John McCain loved bagpipes. He <laughs> loved he loved standards. We're going to hear "My Way" from Frank Sinatra at the end of the memorial service today, uh, and, and we're going to see a repeat performance of those bagpipes at the National Cathedral on Saturday. That was something that uh, he made sure was in this program. Uh, so you know. For anyone who knew John McCain and knew him well, there are going to be a lot of personal touches in this ceremony. And I think in many ways it's going to be a lighter ceremony than, um, than what we saw yesterday. Certainly there will be tears and there will be tough moments. But I spoke to one of his friends, Grant Woods, who was the first chief of staff to a very young Congressman McCain hmm. back in the early 1980s. He went on to be uh, the, as Arizona State Attorney General. He's a lawyer here in Phoenix. He's going to be speaking today, and he has had a lot of time to think about what he's going to say because he, too, was asked back in March if he would be willing to speak when the time came. And he said, you know, there are some inappropriate stories, and I've been going back and forth about whether to share them, but I finally figured, hey, that's what John McCain would want. He would want me to tell those stories. Um, and so, you know, we, we've been talking a lot about John McCain, the military hero this week, uh, John McCain, the senator. Uh, but there's also John McCain, the jokester and the straight talker. Mm -hmm. uh, you heard Lindsey Graham the other day say uh, that if he was John McCain's wingman, his code, his code name uh, was Little Jerk. That's what <laughs> McCain liked to call him. Uh, so this was somebody who was sarcastic and had a, had a great sense of humor and loved to put others down, put himself down in jest, and I think you're going to get a flavor of that today at this uh, memorial service. And uh, Nancy, I believe you spoke to one of his other friends, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Tommy Espinoza. Did you speak to him as well? I did speak to him as well. Another uh, relationship that was forged decades ago, another unlikely friendship, some would say. Uh, here you had a young Republican congressman and a young Latino activist from a time back in the 1980s when the Latino population was not as large and influential in Arizona as it is today. So uh, as Espinoza put it in our conversation, there really wasn't a huge upside for McCain back then to befriend uh, an activist in the Latino community, but uh, they just had a similar sensibility. They had similar interests in making sure that the Latino community was well served. And uh, so they hit it off in the early 80s and they did countless town halls together. Uh, they traveled the state together. Espinoza told me that uh, one of the reasons that be they became friends so quickly was that McCain asked him if he'd like to have dinner. And Espinoza said, sure, sure. You know, I've heard members of Congress say before that they'd, they'd like to get together. It doesn't happen. But in this case, they actually set a date. And so Espinoza said, all right, why don't you come over to my house for dinner and I'll, and I'll barbecue some steaks. Well, right before McCain showed up, Espinoza found out that it was actually his birthday. 
and that uh, McCain was keeping this um, this promise to come over even though he uh, was leaving a family celebration to do so. So Espinoza very quickly uh, uh, rang up a, a mariachi band and got them to come over to his house so that they could serenade John McCain and Cindy McCain as they walked through the door and sing uh, Feliz Cumpleaños. And McCain got such a kick out of that uh, and had such a great time that, uh, you know, they, they, they clearly, they hit it off. They had the same sense of humor, and they were very good friends right up until his death. Uh, that, that's a great story. I see, I see a little bit of a musical theme. We talked about the Native American performer, the bagpipes, uh, this story, and I was mm -hmm. just talking to Doug Weed, historian, and the story that he told me about uh, McCain was him dancing to sort of military standards and, and being caught yes. up in a military band, and it reminded me of how much the military meant to him. Do you think he could talk a little bit about that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, look, he comes from a, a long line of, of Navy admirals, as you know. It was sort of preordained that he was going to go to the Naval Academy himself. Uh, he seemed to struggle with that personally at first. It might have something to do with the fact that he finished, as he loved to tell everyone, <laughs> fifth from the bottom of his class at the Naval Academy, wore it uh, as a badge of honor for the rest of his life. Uh, probably uh, thought that he was the black sheep of the family, wasn't going to amount to much at that point in his life. Uh, and certainly he proved uh, everyone, including possibly himself, wrong about that. Um, you know, even after he was released from imprisonment in Vietnam and came back to the United States, he maintained a commitment to the military that lasted his entire life. He was the chairman of the Armed Services Committee in the Senate for the last three years of his life. He served on the Armed, Armed Services Committee for decades. Um, the last Defense Authorization Act, which was signed just a couple of weeks ago, was named after him. Uh, he is someone who fought to make sure that the military had the resources that it needed, um, while at the same time fighting to make sure that it wasn't wasting money on things that it didn't need. Um, he's someone who traveled the globe, uh, not to fancy and exciting places, but to hot spots and war zones and, um, and, and areas where people were suffering because he knew that he was someone who was recognizable around the world as a symbol of freedom, uh, as a symbol of American democracy, and even if there wasn't something that he personally could do to improve the situation, he knew that going to these places uh, gave people hope and gave them a sense that the United States had not forgotten about them. Yeah, Nancy, I just want to remind everybody of what we're watching right now. Uh, Senator McCain's body has been uh, at the state capitol building, but it is now on its way to the North Phoenix Baptist Church, where there will be a ceremony in a little, uh, probably in maybe 20 minutes or so. So you're looking at the uh, motorcade here, along with the hearse carrying the senator's body, as well as uh, family members, family members and friends at the service today, uh, former Vice President Joe Biden will be speaking along with a close friend of uh, the Senator Tommy Espinoza and Larry Fitzgerald, Arizona Cardinals uh, player, who also a very close friend. There are 24 sitting senators who will be in attendance. There will be four former senators. 50, or 14 of them, rather, of the sitting senators are Republicans, 10 are Democrats. Um, so it, even in his passing, he continues to enjoy bipartisan support. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm just going to be, in fact, Nancy, you know, I think I'm going to stop talking here and let's just dip in and sort of listen as the uh, Hearst uh, arrives.
Thank you.
You may be seated. On behalf of the McCain family, thank you all so much for being here this morning as we remember and celebrate the life of Senator John McCain, a true American hero, a man loved by this church, a man loved by this nation in this city, a man of courage, a man of faith, and a man who dearly loved his family. As we celebrate and get into the service, I want to offer you a word of scripture from the word of God that will bring us comfort. It comes from the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 14. The word of God says this, brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. What a word of promise, hope, and comfort from the word of God. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, the creator and maker of all things, there is nothing new under the sun for you, Father. You know all things before they happen. And this morning, Lord, we pray for the friends and family of Senator McCain. And we will grieve, we will mourn, Father. But we will do so with a different hope because of the faith he has placed in Jesus Christ. That we can, with confidence, grieve with the hope to know that this very moment, he is spending eternity with Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. What a comfort. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 2. To everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under the heaven, and a time to be born, and a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up the witches planted. I was 28 years old, and um, I'd only been a public defender as a few years out of law school. And for some reason, John McCain asked me to be his chief of staff when he got elected. So on my first day at 7 AM, John McCain picked me up at my house. I went to the car, and I said, well, do you want me to drive? He goes, no, no, I, I'm going to drive. So I said, well, maybe I can sit in the back seat. Uh, I'm no expert on this, but I thought the staff drove. He goes, no, get in the car, boy, get in the car. And for the next half hour, we just uh, talked about uh, the football games the day before and uh, whatever was in the news and politics and told a few jokes. And uh, it was, uh, at the same time, just really a lot of fun and also quite terrifying because of his ridiculously bad driving. Um, <laughs> So he'd get excited, he would kind of, you know, he drove like this anyway, and then he would get excited and just start drifting off, and I'm like, hey, hello over there. <laughs> so we finally got where we were going, and I said, oh, hey, by the way, uh, what are we doing? And he goes, oh, uh, you know, I hired the whole staff, and I want you to meet them. I said, oh, okay, that's good. <laughs> so, um, so we met the staff, and then um, we went back uh, to the car. We got in the car, and all the staff came out, and they were all waving and things. And I said, well, they seem to be very nice. He goes, oh, you're going to have to fire half of them. <laughs> I said, what? what are you talking about? And he just sped off, and uh, the staff was waving. And uh, about one minute later, we went right back by, because he'd gone the wrong way, of course. <laughs> he waved again. And I just say that two hours kind of epitomized the next 35 years for me with John McCain. It was at once a little bit harrowing, a little wild, a little crazy, but um, a lot of fun and uh, the greatest honor of my life. I, I have people ask me all the time, did you ever know in those early years, did you have a feeling you had someone so special there? And uh, my answer is yeah, yes, absolutely. No question about it. And I'll tell you one, the, the first time, it was in December, and it was over in my hometown of um, uh, Mesa, Arizona. We were at a Rotary Club, and uh, I think it was all men at that time. And you know, these are tough guys and kind of cynical about things, and here's this new guy in town. And one of them asked them, uh, since it was December, he asked them, what about Christmas in prison? And he told them a couple of, of uh, stories. He told him about one night when he was uh, uh, being interrogated for quite a long time, and it didn't go too well uh, for his captors. They were upset with him. And so they tied him up, and they tied the ropes tight, and it was very painful, and they left him there for the night. And uh, some guard came in who he did not know and never spoken to, and uh, at 10 p.m., the guard walked in and unloosened the ropes. And at about 4 a.m., the guard came back and tightened him up again so that he wouldn't get in trouble. And John didn't know why that happened, but he found out a little clue a couple of weeks later, right before Christmas, when he was standing in the dirt yard, and that guard just walked up next to him. And the guard didn't say a word, but with his sandal, he drew a cross in the dirt. And they, they looked at it for a minute, and then the guard rubbed it out and went on his way. And it was quiet in that room when John told that. And then he said, you know, on Christmas Eve, we celebrated. 
and we got together under this bare light bulb and we sang Christmas carols and we quoted Bible verses that we could remember and we told the gospel story to each other. And I guess just that image of this band of brothers together in this God-forsaken place singing to each other and there at the front, our guy, John McCain, beaten up but not down, singing his favorite Christmas carol, Silent Night, Holy Night, all is calm, all is bright, round young virgin, mother and child, holy infant, so tender and mild. The words seem so far away from that place, but they leaned on the faith of their fathers and their faith in each other and their faith in their country and their faith in God. I looked out into that audience there in my hometown and those were some of my peers and the peers of my parents. Those are tough, independent guys. They're ranchers and farmers. They're some cowboys, businessmen, entrepreneurs, and they were crying because they saw in John McCain a little bit of what they hoped to see in themselves. They saw in John McCain the embodiment of values that they hoped to see for their country. Over the next few months and years, John got to know this place, and he fell in love with Arizona. He loved the people, our diversity, our Native American community, our Hispanic culture, and he loved the place, in particular, the Grand Canyon, the Colorado River. We floated down that twice together, and then he kept going back and back. He loved it. He hiked the canyon with, with Jack not that long ago, rim to rim. He loved Sedona. He loved this place. And if John McCain fell in love with Arizona, Arizona fell in love with John McCain. We ran a lot of races here, a lot of elections. He never lost, never really very close. Arizona loved him. We had one little blip one time when he ran for the Senate the first time. He called me on the phone. He goes, well, boy, I think I, I might have screwed up. I go, what? He said, well, you know, I was talking to these students at U of A, and they said, how come you're the only politician that comes down here? They only go to the retirement places. He said, well, it's because you guys don't vote. <laughs> okay? Those other dudes vote like 100%, you know? So <laughs> you want people to come down here, you need to vote like they vote out at Seizure World. I said, y you didn't say that, did you? Because <laughs> there's this big retirement community called Leisure World in the East Valley. <laughs> and uh, they weren't real happy with their new nickname out there. <laughs> so John said, like he always does, he said, okay, I screwed up, let's go. We gotta go out there, we. And um, <laughs> so we went out. And I remember we drove in, and there was an, about a 90-year-old guy in a golf cart right there, and he was giving us the finger. <laughs> and uh, little did he know, we both said, that's great. We love that. <laughs> and John was like, hey, good to see you. Good to see you, pal. Thank you. Thank you. So he we went in. He said, oh, sorry about that, and went, went to work. And guess what? I think he won that about 85-15 in that election, in that precinct. So we're, we're going to miss so many things about him here in our state, his leadership here on these important issues. We're going to miss his sense of humor. We're going to miss his, his love of sports. He, he, he loved the teams, all of our teams. I mean, by love them, I mean love them, like nonstop, okay? And, um, and he loved you guys, Fitz and Gonzo and Shane. He really did. Not a coincidence. He didn't become friends just with the best players. 
but with the best people. And um, he loved you guys. But I think we also worry here in Arizona about a bigger picture. And I hope that what he stood for will um, maybe get a renewed uh, look in our country. That's what he would want. He would want us to, okay, we recognize him now, but now let's get to work. And I'm sure the Vice President will talk about John and bipartisanship, but he believes so much that this, in the end, when it's all said and done, this Republican Democrat thing's not that important, is it? We're all Americans, and you've got to get to the point where we can, we can work together as Americans. His support of the military, I hope you members of Congress will, will keep that strong. It was so important that he had their backs. And one other thing. John McCain believed in our Constitution, and he stood up for it. He fought for it every step of the way. So he would not stand by as people tried to trample the Constitution or the Bill of Rights, including the First Amendment. And you know what? He believed in the Declaration of Independence. When we proclaim to the world that every single human being is important, every single human being is precious, every single person in this world has the right to live free. Not because the government says so, but because God gave us that right. So John McCain, his entire life, stood by the freedom fighters across the world. He was there. He was there figuratively and literally, by their side, wherever they were, acknowledging their right to live free. It's it's a long and winding road that took him from that dirt yard in Hanoi to the dirt back roads of Hidden Valley. But through it all, he was resolute. He was courageous every step of the way. And in Arizona, he was our hero. I think you can see from this outpouring of support and love for John McCain, that he was America's hero. Senator John McCain from Arizona, he served his country with honor. He fought the good fight. He finished the race. He kept the faith. Now, my friend, we can finish the song. Sleep in heavenly peace. Sleep in heavenly peace. Amen. Well, I, I had the great opportunity of meeting uh, Congressman John McCain in Washington. C. Hallett was back there, and I was visiting, and uh, he said, you, you need to meet this congressman, this young maverick, full of energy. And I said, oh, yeah. He says, besides that, he's going to become president of the United States one of these days, so you need to meet him. I said, okay. So we met in Virginia, in Arlington, uh, Ella, Ella, yeah, my apologies. It was rough getting up here. Uh, Alexandria. Cindy and CA and myself, and we had dinner in this nice little restaurant. And we chatted for a while, and then all of a sudden, with John McCain, you just bond. I mean, there's something about his energy level that goes up. He starts talking, starts asking me about my background. Of course, I, not knowing him that well, asked him about his. And before I knew it, we felt very comfortable with each other going back and forth. So then I got enough nerve to ask him. I said, Congressman, what, what was it that allowed you to be in a prisoner of war camp? I mean, what kept you together? 
And he said, well, he goes, you know, most people ask me how they treated me, and obviously they treated me pretty bad. He goes, but he said, my, one is my faith in God, my love for my family, and my faith in my country. He said, those things kept me, kept me together. So we kept talking that evening, and as I thought about that, that discussion, and for this, this talk, I wanted to reflect with you a reading from Corinthians 13, which I think captures, captures uh, Senator John McCain. Corinthians 13. Though I should give away to the poor all that I possess, and even give up my body to be burned, if I am without love, it will do me no good whatever. When you think about an individual like Senator McCain, who suffered, who was in prison, was injured, and yet with all that, was able to keep his faith together, his focus on his country, focus on his family, I believe that that period of time, those five years, is where God molded this fantastic hero, where God took an opportunity to humble this young man who came from a military family. God used those minutes, those hours, those days, those years to put together a human being that we'll be talking about the senator for generations. John McCain was a person who loved, with his energy, who loved all of us, who loved his country. That evening while we were having dinner, he said, when we get back to Phoenix, we need to get together and have dinner. And of course, back then I was pretty cocky. So I said, well, Congressman, I know a number of congressmen, and I know a couple of senators, and you know, we always hear that. He says, well, no, when you get back, you give me a date, and, uh, and I'll be there. I said, well, I'm going to invite you to my house. Us, us Mexican-Americans love to cook, and we love to have folks at our homes if you're really going to be a friend. And he chuckled. So a couple of months later, when I got back home, we called, set up a a dinner at the house, and of course I was preparing carne asada, frijolitos, arroz, tortillas, and all the stuff that you all know about, and my homemade salsa. And I get a call from his office, they say he's running late. So I ask, what's the problem? I said, well, it's his birthday. He wanted to spend a little bit of time with his family. <laughs> Sorry, Cindy. And of course, I panic and say, you know, if he wants to cancel, I, I understand, please. They said, no. He made it very clear to us, he's going to your house tonight to have dinner. So I scrambled and got a mariachi group. <laughs> I figured I got to do something really good. <laughs> Mexican food's not going to get me there. And luckily, they got there about 10 minutes before he arrived. <clears throat> so when Cindy and, and the congressman then walk into my house, the kitchen, the mariachi started playing. They sing in the Mañanitas, which is a traditional Mexican birthday song for, in our culture. And of, and of course, John and Cindy lit up, and it was a great evening, and we, we enjoyed, the, enjoyed the night. That's. Senator John McCain keeps his word. That's the senator that we've had all these years that sometimes we beat up on. That's the senator that I hope people can embrace what he stood for, for our country. And yes, he was a maverick. In his first senatorial campaign, I get a call and it's him on the phone. I'm with Father Tony, a dear friend of mine, and he's, they say he's, he's 
you got the congressman on the phone. I don't know how he tracked me down, but we're in a restaurant. So I get the phone, and he says, Tommy, I'm running for the U.S. Senate. I'm going to launch, blah, blah, blah. You know, John, he was going 100 miles an hour. So I'm going like, OK. And then he says, I want you to co-chair my campaign. I said, well, uh, John, you know I'm a Democrat. <laughs> I, I'm not sure that's going to help you with your Republican campaign. I said, I don't care. You're my friend. I want you to coach your. I said, well, let me sleep on it. No. No, no. You give me an answer right now, yes or no. And of course, I said yes. Once again, Senator John McCain goes over to the other side. And don't forget, I was like an activist back then. I was running Chicanos por la Causa. I mean, we were not like, the most liberal organization or the most conservative organization in the country. And we go back and forth with, with, with John, you either were a friend or not. And at the end of the day, we could go a couple of years without seeing each other. But when we did, it was like old home week. I mean, he was warm. He was energy. I mean, he was going 100 miles an hour, but yet he made time to be with you. And then the second time, we get a call, Elvira and I, to come to Las Vegas. And this is, of course, when he's in his presidential campaign. And we, we end up in Las Vegas with his, his two right-hand folks that have always run his campaigns, which I have the greatest respect for. So we do the quick chit-chat. And then John says, uh, I, I want you to speak on my behalf at the Republican Convention. I said, uh, Senator, I want to remind you I'm a Democrat. <laughs> ah, I don't care. I want you there. So you're my friend. I want you there. I said, uh, yes, I'll, I'll be there. He said, well, he says, with a big smile on his face, watch out when you start your car. <laughs> I said, Okay, Senator, <laughs> I'll do that. So John kind of put me out on the national scene. And, uh, if, and I must confess, he did a number of things that I could stand here all day and share with you different stories. I will tell you that that one time when we met is, is when Megan was on the TV program, and I don't even remember the name of the TV program, Megan, but he said, well, you know, Megan's on TV now, and blah, blah, blah. I go, yeah, okay. Do you see her? Uh, no, Senator, I don't watch TV that much. Well, you start watching her. <laughs> okay. So that was our, our great Senator. As we were walking out, he asked my, my wife, Elvira, he says, Vita, I got a question for you. If, if I put a woman on our, on our ticket as vice president, what do you think about that? Well, my wife isn't the type that holds back. She's a Mexican from Mexico City. And they have a tendency of just telling you how, how they it is. And of course, the senator liked that. So she turns and she says, well, I really don't care if it's a man or a woman. If something happens to you, I want to make sure that person can run the country. So John looked at her and says, OK. And he looked at his two guys. And of course, we walked out. Needless to say, we heard later who had selected. But again, regardless, there was the senator again taking the risk of putting forth a woman for vice president of this great country of ours. So it's of no surprise. It's of no surprise also that he got together with Kennedy to push for immigration reform. Because when he talked about immigration, it wasn't so much the politics of it. He would say, you know what? I can't believe these families that come from another country, from Mexico, from Central America, to work, cutting our grass, feeding us, bringing in the labor force that we need, and now we turn on them? That really struck at the heart of what he thought our great country was about. I believe it cost him a presidential campaign. 
So to me, it's very dear what the senator is about. To me, John really did reflect our country in its true form. My father is a Marine, passed away in February. Once a Marine, always a Marine, he'd say. Got wounded in Guam, got a purple heart. When he talked about John McCain, he said, he understands us. He understands us. And I must confess, he did understand us. He understood all of us, whether it was white, black, brown, Asian. To him, it didn't make any difference. What he knew is that we all make America great. We all make America great. So I hope that in his legacy, the senators, governors, mayors, city council members, elected officials, embrace the thought of love. Because John reflected love and love of a strong man. And that is nowadays hard to come by. So his legacy will go on for generations because people will talk about Senator John McCain as one of the greatest heroes in our lifetime. And with that, if you permit me, read Timothy 2. As for me, my life is already being poured away as a libation and the time has come for me to depart. I have fought the good fight to the end. I have run the race to the finish. I have kept the faith. My dear friend, vaya con Dios. Gracias. I fell in love with my country when I was a prisoner in someone else's. 
Senator McCain spoke these heartfelt words as he accepted the Republican nomination for president in 2008. They were the words of an authentic American hero. We all know how the story goes. A fiery Navy pilot shot down by the North Vietnamese over a lake near Hanoi. As his plane spun out of control, he bailed out just in time to plunge into the lake below. That pilot, a young John McCain, was taken hostage as a prisoner of war, where he spent more than five and a half years, almost 2,000 days, he would endure countless beatings, torture, solitary confinement, and mental and emotional anguish that none of us will ever have to endure. After getting to know Senator McCain, I felt compelled to visit Vietnam. I wanted to see the places where the will of John McCain was tested and forged. I saw the lake. I walked the steps. I sat in the cell. And the ordeal that my friends survived became all the more real. Many people might wonder what a young African-American kid from Minnesota and a highly decorated Vietnam War hero turned United States Senator might have in common. Well, I, I, I thought of a few. I'm black, he was white. <laughs> I'm young, he wasn't so young. <laughs> he lived with physical limitations brought on by war. I'm a professional athlete. He ran for president, I run out of bounds. <laughs> he was the epitome of toughness, and I do everything I can to avoid contact. <laughs> I have flowing locks, and well, he didn't. <laughs> How does this unlikely pair become friends? I've asked myself the same question. But do you know what the answer is? That's just who he is. Over the several years I had the privilege of spending time with Senator McCain, sometimes it was just a visit to our practices, other times it was him texting and saying, oh, you need to pick it up this Sunday. <laughs> I'm thankful that through these moments, the opportunity that we had to share our lives, and more importantly, our stories. While from very different worlds, we developed a meaningful friendship. And this highlights the very rare and very special qualities of Senator McCain that I came to deeply admire. He didn't judge individuals based on the color of their skin, their gender, their backgrounds, their political affiliations, or their bank accounts. He evaluated them on the merits of their character and the contents of their hearts. He judged them on the work they put in and the principles they live by. It was this approach to humanity that made Senator John McCain so respected by countless people around the world, including me. His accomplishments were many, U.S. Senator, presidential candidate, statesman, warrior, and hero. His work ethic, tireless. His fight, legendary. But what made Senator McCain so special was that he cared about the substance of my heart more so than where I came from. While some might find our friendship out of the ordinary, it was a perfect example of what made him an iconic figure of American politics and service to fellow man. He celebrated differences. He embraced humanity, championed what was true and just, and saw people for who they were. Yes, ours was an unlikely friendship, but it's one that I will always cherish. I've had the honor of attending several of the Sedona forums hosted by Senator McCain and his remarkable wife, Cindy. There were world leaders in politics, business, science, and education to discuss the most pressing matters of our time. Issues like healthcare, global warming, technology, and human trafficking. These leaders gathered to find real solutions, and they gathered because Senator McCain asked them to be there. His devotion to making Arizona, the United States, and the whole world a better place for everyone has inspired countless leaders, like those at the Sedona Forums. I'm confident his legacy of devotion and to the common good will continue to inspire people around the world long after today. A few years ago, he was kind enough to take me on a personal tour of the U.S. Senate. It was obvious that Senator McCain 
was highly regarded. He believed to be right and was good regardless of which political side of the aisle his opinion fell on. I saw how respected he was and how much admiration he commanded from people from across the political spectrum. But that admiration wasn't surprising because Senator McCain was known as a man of integrity and conviction. A man who at times, just as he sacrificed himself for his fellow POWs in Vietnam, willingly chose to sacrifice his own political gains in order to accomplish what he believed was best for all. As, as a result of this type of fat sacrifice, he may have lost the support of a political ally here and there, but he gained the respect and admiration of an entire nation. In closing, I'd like to honor the love I saw in Senator McCain. He loved the people of Arizona, serving them passionately and diligently for decades. He took that same love to Washington and boldly advocated for the freedoms and liberties he had grown to love as a young Navy pilot. But the love I saw most was the love he had for his wife, Cindy, and his children. I heard him speak about them often, and the love always came pouring through in every word. Senator McCain, it's been a true honor to call you friend. Your toughness and bravery inspired us. Your sacrifice enriched our lives. Your devotion to the people of Arizona, our nation, and your convictions won our admiration. Your love set an example for all of us to follow. Jackie Robinson once said, a life is not important except in the impact that it has on other lives. Senator McCain, we will miss the blessings of being in your presence, but we will never forget the impact you had on the world and more importantly, on each of the lives that you touched. We are all better for having known you. Rest in peace, my friend. My name's Joe Biden. <laughs> I'm a Democrat. <laughs> and I love John McCain. I have had the uh, dubious honor over the years of giving some eulogies for fine women and men that I've admired. But, Lindsay, this one's hard. The three men who have spoken before me, I think, captured John, different aspects of John, in a way that only someone close to him could understand. But uh, the way uh, I look at it, the way I thought about it was that uh, I always thought of John as a brother. We had a hell of a lot of family fights. <laughs> we go back a long way. I was a young United States senator. I got elected when I was 29, and I was had the dubious distinction of being put on the Foreign Relations Committee, which uh, the next. Uh, youngest person was uh, 14 years older than me. And uh, um, I, uh, I spent a lot of time uh, traveling the world because I was assigned uh, a responsibility. My colleagues in the Senate know I was chairman of the European Affairs Subcommittee. So I spent a lot of time on NATO and then the Soviet Union. And. Uh, Along came a guy a couple years later, a guy I knew of, admired from afar, your husband, who had been a prisoner of war, who had endured enormous, enormous pain and suffering, and demonstrated uh, the code, the, uh, the um, McCain code. People don't think much about it today, but imagine having already known the pain you were likely to endure and being offered the opportunity to go home. 
but say no. As the sun can tell you, the Navy, last one in, last one out. So I knew of John. And John became the Navy liaison officer in the United States Senate. There was an office uh, then it used to be on the, the basement floor of members of the military who are assigned to senators when they travel abroad to meet with heads of state or other foreign dignitaries. And uh, John had been recently released from the Hanoi Hilton, a genuine hero, and uh, he became the Navy liaison. For some reason, we, uh, we hit it off from the beginning. Um, we were both full of dreams and ambitions and an overwhelming desire to make the time we had there um, worthwhile, to try to do the right thing, to think about how we could make things better for the country we love so much. And John and I ended up traveling. Um, every time I went anywhere, I took John with me or John took me with him. And we were in China, Japan, Russia, Germany, France, England, Turkey, all over the world, tens of thousands of miles. And, uh, and we would sit on that plane and late in the night when everyone else was asleep and just talk, getting to know one another. We talk about family. We talk about politics. We talk about international relations. We talk about promise the promise of America, because we're both cockeyed optimists and really believe that there's not a single thing beyond the capacity of this country. I mean, for real, not a single thing. And, uh, and when you get to know another woman or man, you get to know their hopes and their fears. You get to know their family even before you meet them. You get to know how they feel about really important things. We talked about everything except captivity and the loss of my family, which had just occurred, my wife and daughter. Only two things we didn't talk about. But I found that uh, it wasn't too long into John's duties that uh, Jill and I got married. And Jill is here with me today. Five years, I had been a single dad. And, uh, and no man deserves one great love, let alone two. And I met Jill, who changed my life. And, uh, and she fell in love with him, and he with her. He'd always call her, as, as Lindsay later would travel, he'd call her Jilly. And a uh, and, uh, matter of fact, uh, when they'd get bored uh, being with me on these trips. I remember going to see Carmen Lise in Greece. And he said, why don't I just take Jill to dinner? I later learned that they're down in a, in a, uh, a cafe and a, on the, at the port, and he has her dancing on top of a cement table drinking ouzo. <laughs> Not a joke. Chili. Right, Chili? <laughs> So, uh, but um, we got to know each other well. And he loved my son, Bo, and my son, Hunt. As a young man, he came up to my house. He'd come up to, to Wilmington. And uh, out of this grew a great friendship that transcended whatever political differences we had or later developed. Because above all, above all, um, we understood the same thing. All politics is personal. It's all about trust. And I trusted John with my life, and I would. And I think he would trust me with his. We both knew then from our different experiences that, uh, and as our life progressed, we learned even more, that there are times when life can be so cruel, pain so blinding, it's hard to see anything else. The, the disease that took John's life, took our mutual friends, Teddy's life, the exact same disease nine years ago, a couple days ago. And three years ago, it took 
my beautiful son Bo's life. It's brutal. It's relentless. It's unforgiving. And it takes so much from those we love and from the families who love them that in order to survive, we have to remember how they lived, not how they died. I carry me with, with me an image of Bo sitting out in a little lake we live on, starting a motor on a little boat and smiling and waving. Not the last days. I'm sure Vicki Kennedy has her own image, maybe looking, seeing Teddy looking so alive on that sailboat out in the Cape. And for the family, for the family, you will all find your own images, whether it's remembering his smile or his laugh or a touch in the shoulder or just running his hand down your cheek, or just feeling like someone's looking at and turning and see him just smiling at you from a distance, just looking at you. Or when you saw the sheer joy that crossed his face the moment he knew he was about to get up and take a stage in the center floor and start a fight. <laughs> God, he loved it. <laughs> so to Cindy and to the kids, Doug, Andy, Sydney, Megan, Jack, Jimmy, Bridget, and I know she's not here, but to Mrs. McCain, we know how difficult it is to bury a child, Mrs. McCain. My heart goes out to you. And I know right now the pain you all are feeling is uh, so sharp and so hollowing. And John's absence is all-consuming for all of you right now. It's like being sucked into a black hole inside your chest. And it's frightening. But I know something else, unfortunately, from experience that there's nothing anyone can say or do to ease the pain right now. But I pray, I pray you take some comfort knowing that because you shared John with all of us your whole life, the world now shares with you the ache of John's death. Look around this magnificent church. Look what you saw coming at the state capitol yesterday. It's hard to stand there. But part of it, part of it was, at least it was for me with Bo standing in the state capitol, you knew. It was genuine. It was deep. He touched so many lives. And I've gotten calls, not just because people knew we were friends, not just from people around the country, but leaders around the world calling me. Megan, I'm getting all these sympathy letters. I mean, hundreds of them and tweets. Character is destiny. John had character. While others will miss his leadership and his passion, even his stubbornness, you're going to miss that hand on your shoulder. The family, you're going to miss the man, the faithful man as he was who you would know would literally not figuratively give his life for you. And for that, there's no bomb but time. Time in your memories of a life lived well and lived fully. But I make you a promise. I promise you. The time will come, because what's going to happen is Six months will go by, and everybody's going to think, well, it's past. But you're going to ride by that field, or smell that fragrance, or see that flashing image, 
You're going to feel like you did the day you got the news. But you know you're going to make it when the image of your dad, your husband, your friend, crosses your mind and a smile comes to your lip before a tear to your eye. That's when you know. And I promise you, I give you my word, I promise you, this I know. That day will come. That day will come. You know, uh, I'm sure as my former colleagues and all who work with John, I'm sure there's people who have said to you, not only now, but the last 10 years, explain this guy to me. <laughs> right? Explain this guy to me. Because as they looked at him, in one sense they admired him, but in one sense, they, the way things have changed so much in America, they look at him as if John came from another age, that he lived by a different code, an ancient, antiquated code where honor, courage, character, integrity, duty, where it mattered, because that was obvious how John lived his life. But the truth is, John's code was ageless, is ageless. When you talked earlier, Grant, you talked about values. It wasn't about politics with John. He could disagree on substance, but it was the underlying values that animated everything John did, everything he was. He could come to a different conclusion. But were he part company with you, if you lack the basic values of decency, respect, knowing that this project is bigger than yourself. John's story is the American story. That's not hyperbole. It sounds like it's the American story, grounded in respect and decency, basic fairness, the intolerance for the abuse of power. Many of you have traveled the world Look how the rest of the world until recently looks at us. They look at us as a little naive. We're so fair, we're so decent. We're the naive Americans. But that's who we are, that's who John was. And he could not stand the abuse of power wherever he saw it, in whatever form in whatever country. It's always about basic values, John. Fairness, honesty, dignity, respect, giving hate no safe harbor, leaving no one behind, and understanding that as Americans, we're part of something much bigger than ourselves. With John, it was a value set that was neither selfish nor self-serving. John understood that America was, first and foremost, an idea, audacious and risky, organized around, not tribe, but around ideals. Think of how he approached every issue. The ideals that Americans have rallied around for over 200 years, the ideals that the world has repaired to, an idea enshrined in the Constitution sounds corny. We hold these truths self-evident, that all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. To John, those words had meaning, as they had for every great patriot that has ever served this country. We both love the Senate. Proudest years of my life for being a United States Senator. And I was honored to be Vice President, but being a United States Senator. And we both lament it 
watching it change. During long debates in the 80s and 90s, as some of the colleagues who were around then would know, I'd always go over and sit next to John, next to his seat. Or he'd come over on the Democratic side and sit next to me. No, I'm not joking. Because we'd sit there and we'd talk to each other. And I can remember the day when I came out to see John. We, we reminisced about it. It was in 96. And we were about to adjourn for what we call the caucuses. There's a luncheon once a week that all the Democratic senators have lunch together and all the Republican senators. And we both went into our caucus, and coincidentally, we were approached by our caucus leaders with the same thing. It was raised as a discussion. Joe, it doesn't look good you sit next to John all the time on there. <laughs> Swear to God. Same thing was said to John in your caucus. That's when things began to change for the worse in America, in the Senate. That's when it changed. What happened was, at those times, it was always appropriate to challenge another senator's judgment, but never appropriate to challenge their motive. When you challenge their motive, it's impossible to get to go. If I say you're doing this because you're being paid off, if I say you're doing this because you're not a good Christian, if I say you're doing this because you're this, that, or other thing, it's impossible to reach consensus. Think about it in your personal lives. But all we do today is attack the oppositions of both parties, their motives, not the substance of their argument. This is the mid-90s. Well, it began to go downhill from there. The last day John was on the Senate floor, what was he fighting to do? He was fighting to restore what we call regular order, to start to treat one another again like we used to. Scent was never perfect, John. You know that. We were there a long time together. But I'd watch Teddy Kennedy and James O. Eastland fight like hell on civil rights, and they'd go have lunch together down the Senate dining room. John wanted to see, quote, regular order writ large, get to know one another. You know, uh, John and I were both amused, and I think Lindsay was at one of these events where John and I received two prestigious awards. Uh, um, the last year I was as vice president, and then won immediately after for our dignity and respect we showed to one another. We received an award for civility in public life. There's a college, Allegheny County, put, uh, College puts out this prestigious award every year for bipartisanship. And John and I look at each other and say, what in the hell's going on here? <laughs> no, not a joke. I say to Senator Flake, that's how it's always supposed to be. You're getting an award? No, I'm, I'm serious. Think about this. Getting an award for your civility getting an award for bipartisanship. And classic John, the one at Allegheny College, there were hundreds of people there, and we got the award, and John, the Senate was in session, and so he spoke first. And as he walked off the stage and I walked on, he uh, looked at me and said, Joe, don't take it personal, but I just don't want to hear what the hell you have to say. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and left. One of John's major campaign people was now with the Senate, with the governor of Ohio, was on this morning and happened, shaving, happened to watch it, and he said that uh, um, Biden and McCain had this strange relationship. They always seemed to have each other's back. Whenever I was in trouble, John was the first guy there. And I hope I was there for him. 
and we never hesitate to give each other advice. He'd call me in the middle of a campaign and say, what the hell did you say that for? <laughs> well, not an issue. Like, you just screwed up, Joe, you know? And I'd occasionally call him. Look, I've been thinking this week about why John's death has hit the country so hard. Yes, he was a long-serving senator with a remarkable record. Yes, he was a two-time presidential candidate to capture the support and imagination of the American people. And yes, John was a war hero who demonstrated extraordinary courage. I think of John, and I must say my son, when I think of Ingersoll's words, when the will defies fear, when duty throws the gauntlet down to fate, when honor scorns to compromise with death, that is heroism. Nobody knows that about John. But I don't think it fully explains why the country has been so taken by John's passing. I think it's something more intangible. I think it's because they knew John believed so deeply and so passionately in the soul of America that he made it easier for them to have confidence and faith in America. His faith in the core values of this nation made them somehow feel it more genuinely themselves. His conviction that we as a country would never walk away from the sacrifices generations of Americans have made to defend liberty and freedom and human dignity around the world it made average Americans proud of themselves and their country. His belief, and it was deep, that Americans can do anything, withstand anything, achieve anything, was both unflagging and ultimately reassuring if this man believed that so strongly. His capacity that we truly are the world's last best hope, that we're the beacon to the world, that there are principles and ideals greater than ourselves and worth suffering, sacrificing for, and if necessary, dying for. Americans saw how he lived his life that way, and they knew the truth of what he was saying. I just think he gave Americans confidence. John was a hero. His character, courage, honor, integrity. But I think the thing that's under, understated the most is his optimism. That's what made John special. Made John a giant among all of us. But in my view, John didn't believe that America's future and fate rested on heroes. What we used to talk about and I liked most about him is he understood what I hope we all remember. Heroes didn't build this country. Ordinary people being given half a chance are capable of doing extraordinary things. Extraordinary things. John knew ordinary Americans understood that each of us has a duty to defend the integrity, dignity, and birthright of every child. They carry it. That good communities are built by thousands of small acts of decency that Americans, as I speak today, show each other every single day. That buried deep in the DNA of this nation's soul lies a flame that was lit over 200 years ago that each of us carries with us. And each one of us has the capacity, the responsibility, and we can screw up the courage to ensure that's not extinguished, and it's a thousand little things that make us different. The bottom line was, I think John believed in us. I think he believed in the American people, not just all the preambles, the Constitution. He believed in the American people, all 325 million of us. And even though John is no longer with us, he left us pretty clear instructions. 
quote, believe always in the promise and greatness of America because nothing is inevitable here. Close to the last thing John said to the whole nation as he knew he was about to depart. That's what he wanted America to understand. Not to build his legacy, he wanted America to remind him to understand. I think John's legacy is going to continue to inspire and challenge generations of leaders as they step forward. And John McCain's impact on America is not over. It's not hyperbole. It is not over. I don't think he's even close. Cindy, John owed so much of what he was to you. You were his ballast. When I, when I was ever with you both, I could just see how he looked at you. Jill's the one when we were in Hawaii and he first met you there, he, he, he kept staring at you and Jill finally said, go up and talk to her. <laughs> and Doug and Andy, Sydney, Megan, Jack, Jimmy, Bridget, you may not have had your father as long as you would have liked, but you got from him everything you need to pursue your own dreams, to follow the course of your own spirit. You are a living legacy, not hyperbole. You're a living legacy and proof of John McCain's success. Now John's going to take his rightful place in the long line of extraordinary leaders in this nation's history who in their time and in their way stood for freedom and stood for liberty and have made the American story the most improbable and the most hopeful and the most enduring story on earth. I know John said he hoped he played a small part in that story. John, you did much more than that, my friend. To paraphrase Shakespeare, we shall not see his like again. The second reading is from 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Thank you. 
Jesus at the uh, final meal he shared with his friends charged them, remember me. Remember me in the breaking of the bread. Bread has to be broken to be shared. We are celebrating today the life of a man who unselfishly was broken that we might be one again. John McCain, our brother, Jesus' brother. To remember, to bring together John McCain, I invite you to share the words of Henry Scott Holland. Laugh as we always laughed at jokes we enjoyed together. Play, smile, think of me, pray for me. Let my name be ever that household word that it always was. Let it be spoken without effect, without a trace of shadow on it. We pray. Lord God, may John McCain's vision be in our eyes, his voice in our words and our tongue, his listening to the needs of others in our ears, his love for his country in our hearts. Bless you, John McCain, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
As we come to a close, I'd like to read some words that were beautifully written by his daughter, Megan. My father is gone, and I miss him as only an adoring daughter can. But in this loss and in this sorrow, I take comfort in this. John McCain, hero of the Republic, and to his little girl, wakes today to something more glorious than anything on this earth. Today, the warrior enters his true and eternal life, greeted by those who have gone before him. And she writes, rising to meet the author of all things. We will grieve, we, we will mourn, but I want you to think about her words. In this very moment, Senator John McCain is in heaven with God the Father and Jesus the Son. No more cancer, no more pain, no more sickness, no more burdens of this world. In fact, his biggest concern is, is probably what channel do I have to find in heaven in order to watch Larry play on Sundays? <laughs> All joking aside, he's a free man and he's more alive than he's ever been. See, Senator McCain professed Christianity. And here's the hope in what Senator McCain believed. He knew Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. He knew Romans 6.23, that the wages of sin was death, but the gift of God was eternal life through his son, Jesus Christ. So the hope that we have is the good news that Senator John McCain believed this passage from John 3.16, that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that who believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. When we grieve and when we mourn, understand that he has eternal life and he is with the Father in heaven because of his faith in Jesus Christ. That is something to find comfort in. That is the reason why Megan can write these words so beautifully. Let us pray together. Father, as we leave from this place, we ask you to give comfort to Cindy and the family. As Vice President Joe Biden said, there will be days that the freshness of this lostness hits them hard, Father. And in those moments, Lord, when they find themselves by themselves mourning this deep, pain and sorrow, will you comfort them, God? Will you give them the strength they need to walk every single day? And God, as we mourn, as your scripture says, we mourn differently with those that have hope because Senator John McCain believed that you sent your only son to walk this earth and live a sinless life, to die on the cross for our sins, for the things that we deserved. And he believed that Jesus Christ was put in a tomb and he rose again and he defeated death. That is a reason to celebrate and that is a reason for us to have comfort. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to thank you all again on the behalf of the McCain family for being here and supporting them. At this moment, we're going to ask you to stay seated until the family, the entire family, has exited the building.
Imagine more fitting end to this memorial service in Arizona at the North Phoenix Baptist Church for Senator John McCain. We've been listening in there to about a 90 minute service, a memorial by friends and family members honoring the late senator and his life. It was a, a ceremony punctuated with tears and dotted with a great deal of laughter and loving memories. I want to bring in CBS News Chief Congressional Correspondent Nancy Cordes, who joins us now from just outside the Phoenix there. Nancy, uh, boy, what a beautiful ceremony, I have to say. I think it was, was the last time we honored the life of uh, Muhammad Ali, of a funeral that was so embracive of so many other people. I'm struck also by former Vice President Joe Biden's remarks, Nancy. Yes, and I think something that you heard from Biden and really every person who spoke in this remarkable memorial service was the fact that uh, they struck what, what might have seemed at, at the beginning like an unlikely friendship with John McCain. Joe Biden, obviously a big Democrat. John McCain was a Republican. Larry Fitzgerald, star athlete, talked about the fact that he was black. John McCain was white. He was young. John McCain was old. Um, and uh, Tommy Espinoza, a Latino activist, talked about the fact that McCain repeatedly asked him to stand by him, asked him to co-chair his Senate campaign, asked him to speak for him at the GOP presidential convention. And each time Espinoza said to him, you know I'm a Democrat, right? <laughs> uh, don't you think that that would be problematic? And yet um, they all struck these friendships with McCain. Uh, and right now behind me, as you can see, the casket is being brought out to the hearse by by the, uh, by the honor guard, uh, they said that they struck up these relationships with him because while politics was very important to him, character and values and fun 
were more important. And, you know, just remarkable to hear from these men and women who uh, had these very, very close friendships with him for decades. We're seeing now Bridget McCain and the children of John McCain entering there. Uh, Nancy, you know, Nancy, you have interviewed Senator John McCain many times throughout your career. Tell us what stands out to you. Well, first of all, uh, how accessible he was to us, which uh, is always something that, that reporters love. He uh, never, uh, you know, shied away from us, always stopped to talk, even if it was just for a moment, even if it was just to, to crack a joke. Um, he wanted us to know how he felt about a variety of issues. He understood that uh, fundamentally, the more he talked about his point of view, and sometimes it was a very lonely point of view in his party, uh, the more he spoke to us, uh, the easier it was for him to get his message out there. Uh, even when he got sick, Rena, and uh, he clearly couldn't speak as well as he had before. Uh, at one point, he was bound to a wheelchair. He had surgery. You could tell that he was in pain. He still stopped and would joke and say, I'm living the dream, I'm living the dream, um, and, and, and go on. But uh, he had a, a lot of affection for reporters. And, you could, and part of the reason, as you heard uh, Joe Biden describe so eloquently in his speech, is that, um, is that John McCain hated abuse of power in any form, in any country around the world. And he viewed the free press as an antidote to that. Nancy, I am just curious, five and a half years as a prisoner of war, battling brain cancer, you described his last conditions in the last few weeks of his life. How was it, Nancy, that he was able to maintain so much optimism through it all? Well, first of all, I think he just had a very unique energy level that most of us can't hope to match. You know, when, when Vice President Biden was talking about the fact that they would talk into the night when everyone else had gone to sleep, that is true. We have mm -hmm. heard stories from Lindsey Graham himself and others of those two just talking and talking. And, you know, he, he had a capacity for a conversation and, and a drive that was unmatched by most people. And he was simply able to get more done than most people because uh, he just didn't flag. Uh, even more remarkable when you think about the fact that this is not only a man whose arms were broken, um, who endured uh, terrible conditions as a prisoner of war in Vietnam for so many years, also battled melanoma before he even uh, got this brain cancer diagnosis. So this is someone who throughout his life had to deal with uh, any number of medical challenges. And when I spoke to Grant Woods the other day, he's the uh, former Arizona attorney general who talked right at the start of the memorial service and had that great story about what a terrible driver McCain was, but he insisted on, <laughs> on driving anyway, and, and that Woods was afraid for his life because every time McCain would get distracted, the car would veer one way or the other way. Um, you know, he said, despite all those injuries, McCain just never really slowed down. He, he, he ignored them. Um, he had the opportunity, for example, to ride first class uh, when he went back and forth between Arizona and Washington, D.C. Of course, you know, when you see uh, a, a war hero and a senator getting on the plane, the airline is likely to bump mm -hmm. you up to first class. But McCain didn't like the way that would look. And so he would squeeze himself into an economy seat, which, huh. of course, had to be much less comfortable uh, for him than it would be to sit in a first class seat. But, um, you know, Woods and, and others have said that's just not who he was. Incredible moment, incredible memory. Nancy Cordes, chief congressional correspondent on the ground there outside of North Phoenix Baptist Church. Nancy, thank you very much. You're welcome. We are watching the images right now, I believe, of the hearse you see right there outside of the North Phoenix Baptist Church. The hearse will now make its way to uh, the uh, airport where it will leave later this afternoon for Washington, D.C., where the memories and the tributes will continue. The, the former senator will lie in state at the Capitol and followed by a service on Saturday at the National Cathedral. Joining me now, though, from Washington is New York Times best-selling history author, historian, and conservative commentator, Doug Weed. Doug, I, I want to get your thoughts. What do you think, Doug, will be the legacy that remains of John McCain that people remember most? 
Hi, Rena. Yeah, uh, well, his bipartisanship and uh, reaching out across the aisle, his integrity, which is ironic because it all kind of started with the Keating Five, and that's what he built. What, what struck me, Rena, watching this service was uh, nobody talks about this, but he was quick tempered. He had a quick temper, mm -hmm. and, and then he just as quickly asked you to forgive him. Uh, I have a friend out in Arizona who uh, he, he, she, he made a mistake. He said the wrong thing about her. He apologized. He sent her flowers. He went to her. He said, you know, I can't kneel because of my injuries, but inside I'm kneeling asking you to please forgive me. And there's a story that I wouldn't be surprised if George W. Bush tells Saturday that backstage at the presidential debates, debates in Des Moines, there was a little boy who was dying of brain cancer and he wanted autographs and George W. Bush gave him an autograph. But his real hero was John McCain because his own father was was a Navy SEAL. Mm -hmm. And at the time, Senator McCain was very upset. The debate hadn't gone well. He wasn't doing good in, in the campaign, and he was rushing to get out of there backstage. And the father of this boy raced down the corridor, tapped him on the back, and McCain turned, turned around angrily. What's going on? Cindy kind of touched him to calm down. <laughs> and they explained that this boy wanted the autograph. And McCain just broke. He said, oh, I'm so sorry. Wow. And he, he signed this long autograph. I thought of that as I watched the service because John McCain died of brain cancer those mm. many years later. You know, you talk about brain cancer. It was so many people mentioning about um, Ted Kennedy, also about Joe Biden's son, Bo, uh, all ended up dying from, from brain cancer as well. What do you think it is? The, his fight really at the end, Doug, uh, the last few months, they were not easy. What do you think it says sort of about his temperament and his ability to sort of stay optimistic despite it all? Yeah. Yeah, isn't that something? <laughs> it's a it's a great lesson for life for all of us. He 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 did not immerse himself in the bad luck of what he was facing. I love the words. He took time to think this through, Rena, obviously, because he left us with these wonderful thoughts of the last uh, weeks of his life. And that was one of them, that he doesn't regret anything. Reminded me of Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt used to say to his kids, life is glorious. Glorious. Mm -hmm. And here's John McCain, the same thing. He, he doesn't regret a moment of it. And that's in the song that they sang, too, on his way out. And, Doug, we know that he had so much influence and input over how this funeral would be, the memorial services, five days of honoring him. What do you think was important for him to convey through these days of mourning? Yeah, isn't that amazing, Rena, to see what we're watching and hearing he planned. He's communicating to us the message that he wanted. And of course, the battle now is for his legacy. And <laughs> that's kind of that's kind of like a, a slam dunk. <laughs> mm -hmm. But he's still speaking to us from the grave through these other speakers and through these events that he's planned. And uh, he's done it well, like a lot of things he's done in life. He's done it well. Well, and it's going to make his legacy really shine. We have a live look here, Doug, of the hearse, uh, and you see the motorcade, the police uh, traveling with the body as it'll make its way to the airport and then head over to Washington, D.C. Doug, can you tell us why the senator chose to be buried at the Naval Academy instead of Arlington National Cemetery, as many veterans often do? Yeah, well, I can't tell you exactly why, but I know he, how he loved the military and he loved the Navy. And and I mentioned earlier to Anne Marie how he, I was backstage with him once when they started playing some of those anthems and he stood up like a little nine year old child and marched around the little trailer backstage where we were, the speakers were, and uh, it was very, very much into it. But particularly because his father was an admiral, his grandfather was an admiral, that was the tradition. that He grew up in that. That was steeped in him. I knew your father. Your, I knew your grandfather. He was a hero, and he was hearing all these stories. Now here he comes back home, really, uh, to, to no longer in the shadows, now a great figure of history. And as you know, they're already talking about naming one of the senatorial buildings after. That's really mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. There's only four or five senators who could get that. That's a, a, an amazing uh, moment for us to see his the passing of a great man.
And also just how across the aisle, how revered and how loved. We should note there were 24 either current or sitting, uh, current or past senators who actually made the trip out to Arizona to also honor and remember him. Uh, one of them, former senator and former Vice President Joe Biden, he, he starts off, Doug, I, I thought it was, it was actually quite funny. He says, my name is Joe Biden. I'm a Democrat and I love John McCain. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. This is uh, bipartisanship. It's what the American people long for and would love to see. A and uh, yet it's uh, such a bitter time. It, it takes unusual people to reach across the aisle and to uh, close that gulf. It's interesting, because when you go to other countries and you look back on America, we're so much alike uh, compared to political parties in other countries that really debate opposites. You, but you get home and it's just like cousins or a fight within the family. It can become so bitter. The closer we are, the more bitter sometimes the fight can be. But this, uh, this time of mourning of John McCain uh, certainly gives us the wisdom feeling of how wonderful it would be if we could work together mm. once again. He wasn't also afraid to sort of stand up, even if it meant within his own party. Uh, you know, I remember back to the Iraq war with President George W. Bush, whether it was torture, Abu Ghraib, the Iraq war, he wasn't afraid to hold the administration accountable no matter what. Why was it? And he was a voice, obviously, that people really held in high regard because of his time abroad and as a prisoner of war. But why do you think it is when you talk about war? and, you know, his time on um, the Senate Armed Services Committee. What do you think it is that he wants people to remember about life abroad serving your country? Yeah, well, again, Hanoi Hilton shaped his life, and of, uh, among other things, it took the fear away. Uh, Abraham Lincoln talked about that. Abraham Lincoln, after the loss of his son, Eddie, um, he, he told his law partner, I can't go home. Every room I go into, I see my little boy. And he actually went into public life to to be alone, to to escape uh, home. And, and Mary, who reminded him of the loss that he had, he went into public life, all these people, to be alone. And I think a part of John McCain, he suffered so much in that war, it was like, what more can happen? He, he saw how bad it can get, and that's what made life and living glorious for him and what perhaps emboldened him to do what you said, to speak up on some of these issues. <laughs> what can happen to me any worse than what I've already experienced? Mm. We're watching the hearse make its way to the airport, and it will then travel on to Washington, D.C. Doug, you know, watching that beautiful ceremony at North Phoenix Baptist Church, I was just curious about John McCain's own faith. What do we know about his faith? Well, we know, for example, that he's been a member of this church for many years, for much of his life. So, and you can tell by the choice of the speakers and the scriptures they use that this was a part of his life. But it was a personal and a private part of his life. He understood and knew, I actually had a conversation with him about the antipathy in the national media towards many people of faith. And he was smart enough and wise enough not to carry that on his sleeve. Uh, for his own political purposes and throughout his career. But you can see when you face issues of life and death, people have these very deeply held uh, positions and beliefs and ideas, and here they are on full display. And he, he's embracing his faith for his family uh, in, in this, uh, these, this ceremony of these last few days. You know, Doug, in preparing for this week, I was reading uh, more about McCain's life, and one of his friends who actually uh, spoke at his uh, memorial service today, Tommy Espinoza, he is actually the godfather to his son Jimmy, uh, tells his great tale about when he, McCain asked him to be his godfather. Tommy Espinoza says, well, you know I'm Catholic, I'm not Baptist. And McCain says, yeah, you know, that's okay, it doesn't matter. Okay, I'll, I'll be the godfather. I mean, he had this sense of including everybody. It wasn't just about this funeral, it was quite about his life. Yeah, and that happens often to politicians uh, 
<laughs> they, they, they heavily criticized some of these politicians, uh, Warren G. Harding, uh, with his close association with Christian scientists. And they criticize them because they feel they don't remain orthodox to their faith. Uh, but by the time you're elected president in the United States or you have a public career like John McCain, you've rubbed shoulders with people from so many sociocultural di uh, different pockets that you kind of develop your own, <laughs> your own version of what you believe and why you believe it. And it has to be more inclusive than it otherwise would be. So it's great when you live there in the province and you can believe what you believe till the moment you die when you're surrounded by mom and dad and all your cousins. You get out into public life and you meet people who believe things a little bit differently and you develop a tolerance you wouldn't otherwise have. You know, also in the public light this week, the state of Arizona. It's hard to imagine, Doug, that he was once labeled when he ran for senator a carpetbagger because he wasn't from Arizona originally. Hard to imagine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but now he embraces uh, Arizona, and in Arizona embraces him, and that harkens back to the Keating Five thing. It, it didn't matter what he experienced in life, and it's a lesson that I keep teaching my children and my g grandchildren. None of these setbacks, none of these hurts, none of these accusations, none of these criticisms are fatal. Death is fatal. Anything else you can come back from, you can refashion, and he did that. He became the antithesis antithesis of what had happened to him in the Keating Five, and he, he wiped out all concerns about whether he was a true Arizonan or not. Mm. <laughs> Most Arizonans, by the way, Rena, were not born in Arizona. It's a good point you make. Absolutely good point. Doug, I want to ask you, though, about the next few days. We know that President Obama and President George W. Bush will also deliver eulogies in Washington, D.C. What do you know about that? And what do you know about his relationship with these two former presidents who he once faced off with for the highest office? Well, I don't know anything about what they're planning on saying or doing, but I know. But can you tell us a little bit about their relationship, Doug? Well, yes, we know how deeply bitter the relationship was with George W. Bush, but George W. Bush has an ability to forgive, and John McCain, as I mentioned earlier, has an ability to forgive, and often did. He'd lose his temper, he'd be mad, he'd regret it, he'd go back, and he'd beg for forgiveness. It was a, a, a very a signal characteristic of his personality. And Barack Obama, how, what it must melt Barack Obama's heart every time he sees that video video where John McCain is standing up for him as a family mm. man, even a, a little part of John McCain in the midst of that bitter campaign. He had to recognize that this is a moment of history, an African-American that could be elected president of the United States, you're as hard about, as that was. Doug, you're talking about the moment where uh, somebody says he's Arab and he, he says, no, ma'am, he's a good man. Is that what you're referring to? <laughs> yes, that's yeah. what he said. He's a good man and he's a family man. Yeah. And it's so interesting that... that uh, that Barack Obama was such a family man, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, McCain had to say, this is a man who's been good to his wife and good to his children and had the nice combination. A lot of presidents spoil their children, <laughs> mm. but there was a nice mix of, of love and discipline on the McCain, on the uh, Obama family. And John McCain recognized that and gave credit where it was due. Uh, but we are watching, again, the body of John McCain heading towards the airport as he will head to Washington, D.C., uh, and be honored by his colleagues on Capitol Hill, as well as former presidents, as we mentioned. When you look at the life and the legacy of John McCain, Doug, we've talked so much about how he lived, but I just think it's fascinating also how he chose to die, uh, planning out his funeral in the comfort of his home state, and also... Um, <laughs> really putting in the spotlight brain cancer. I've been reading a great deal about brain cancer and um, how important it was for him to shine a light on that as well. Yeah, and what ha happened to Bo and his, and his relationship with Biden. What's interesting to me, Rena, is how quickly this happened once he went off the medication. Yeah. It's almost like turning off the light switch, yeah. like, okay, I got everything set, got everything done, and now here we go. It, it's like every other part of his life, it seemed like he was in control there, too. Yeah. Um, it's it just hard to ignore, Doug, at the end of that memorial service, how uh, Frank Sinatra played uh, through the crowd at the end of the recessional, My Way. 
<laughs> I, I did it my way. I've yeah. lived that life. Yeah. It's yeah. no accident. It, it makes me curious to see what more is going to unfold as we celebrate his life in uh, Saturday. Yeah. Uh, you know, we talked so much about his legacy, but Doug, is there somebody right now on Capitol Hill or potentially entering Capitol Hill who could come anywhere close to being a future John McCain? Well, there must be, but I don't know who it is, because right now, I mean, naming a building after him, possibly, which they're talking about, uh, and a, naming a building that's named after a Democrat senator, <laughs> making it a Republican mm -hmm. senator, that's a bit unusual. Right now, you've got to put him in the category with Daniel Webster and with Henry Clay and with with uh, Everett Dirksen, and boy, I miss him, and with Robert Taft. He's got to be a among a handful of the greatest senators in American history. Uh, and it, it's going to be hard for somebody overnight <laughs> to match yeah, that. Certainly will be, no matter what. But what do you think it is, Doug? You have had time to interview and sit down with him and meet with him. What stands out to you about John McCain after all these years? Uh, what stands out to me, and you know, it's interesting, Rena, I've interviewed six presidents of the United mm -hmm. States, some of them many, many hours. What surprises me the most about John McCain is his sense of humor and his irreverence and his yeah. sarcasm. He just did not take himself or life or the issues that seriously. He could talk to the issues, but there'd be this sly grin on his face, and he'd come up with, with uh, some humor in it somewhere, and uh, I I loved that about him, and that distinguishes him from many of the other very serious people that I interviewed mm -hmm. who take themselves and take life very seriously. Boy, humor will take you a long way, especially in politics, won't it, Doug? <laughs> That's right. So Absolutely. You need it. <laughs> you definitely need it, without a doubt. As we're watching... Uh, this, uh, the body of John McCain, his casket will now arrive here at the airport and be taken aboard this plane you're seeing here to Washington, D.C. In fact, actually, it'll head first to Joint Base Andrews and then making its way uh, eventually to the National Cathedral. As you know, we're talking about the life and the legacy. What I didn't mention actually earlier at the top, we couldn't see the shot, but there were about a thousand people who chose to gather outside of this church who were allowed, the public, allowed to pay their respects. And I should say they braved almost 100 degree temperatures to stand outside for hours. Uh, obviously, they weren't allowed in. The, the capacity at the church was 2,000, invitation only, as you can imagine, uh, with this level of, of security and VIPs. But a thousand people were allowed to gather outside the church and in the sweltering heat to say goodbye and pay their respects. What does it mean for folks in Arizona when you talk about a man who served 35 years representing the state? Yeah, and you know, most of the people in Arizona are in California this month. because <laughs> it's so it's hot. It's very, very <laughs> hot. So I was so surprised by the numbers, but I've talked to uh, many of my friends in Arizona and asked them that same question and been amazed at friends who, I, I wouldn't use the word hate, but had great anger towards John McCain mm -hmm. because he it was a high wire act mm -hmm. for him to appeal to the media and to appeal to Democrats and build his career doing that, while at the same time representing this very, at the time, conservative state in Arizona. And to do that and get away with it, you see the political career of Jeff Flake, and you get an yeah. idea of how hard it is yeah. to pull that off, but That's he pulled point. it off. And what I hear from them is n nothing but tenderness towards him. And it's usually based on what I told you about earlier, Rena, his uh, ability or his desire to seek forgiveness when he would make a mistake or say it the wrong way. Yeah. He would seek out that person and say, that was wrong of me. I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? That is something very unusual in politics. Very unusual. I'm sorry. It truly is the hardest word for so many of us to say. Uh, I do want to ask you too, Doug, did you ever get a chance to interview his, uh, who is now 106 year old, his mother, Roberta? No, yeah. I never did. I'm just so fascinated <laughs> by, by seeing her during the campaign and uh, 106. Amazing.
<laughs> yeah. Well, we, I, we are told she will, I believe, be actually attending the service at the National Cathedral in D.C., as well as the burial, which will take place, as I mentioned, at the U.S. Naval Academy on Sunday. Um, Joe Biden, I think it was sort of a poignant moment without saying it, talked about how nobody should be around to bury their own child. Yeah. Of course, his own yeah. son passing as well. Yeah. Two, I should say. Yeah. What's interesting to me, Rena, is so many of these great men, great presidents and great presidential candidates are mama's boys mm. and they have an absent father. That was true of George W. Bush when when they said to uh, George H. W. Bush, I bet you're proud of your son. How did you raise him? He says, I wasn't there. Barbara raised him. And uh, of course, Obama's father was absent. And you can go all the way through history and it, the same story over and over, starting with George uh, Washington all the way through history, and definitely with John McCain, too, an absent father, but a very close relationship with a mother. Mm -hmm. We are watching uh, the hearse pull into the airport here in Arizona, Phoenix. You know, I, I was also struck sort of about, uh, during this memorial service, about the attention. He also had a flutist from the Navajo community, uh, how he wanted this to be not just Democrat or Republican, uh, inclusive of sort of the culture there in Arizona as well. Yeah, he's showing off Arizona. Yeah, he really did <laughs> love such that a, state. Such a diverse state and th that music. Uh, there, there were moments that he was moved in life and he wanted us to feel them uh, and to hear them and see them. So everything was was there in this celebration. And uh, it, usually when something like this happens, Rena, you think, oh, if they could only be alive to see this, they would probably yeah. be surprised. But I have a feeling that John McCain is not surprised. This is well thought out. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, and he's directing events beyond the grave. Absolutely. Uh, the casket uh, has made a, actually a six-mile journey from uh, initially this morning from the Arizona State House, motorcaded over to the North Phoenix Baptist Church, where we have the funeral services today, uh, the memorial services, I should say, for the late senator. Of all the speakers, uh, Doug, that spoke today and honored him, what stands out to you? I was really impressed with Grant Wood's mm. yeah. <laughs> speech. That just struck me what as was it? so well done. It was just so balanced, the humor, and uh, he just captured uh, John McCain so well. I thought it was such an honor to McCain that he would spend the time and thought uh, the attorney general to, to, uh, to deliver such an eloquent and, and wonderful testimony to him. I was deeply impressed by that. You know, it says something, too, that so many former folks who worked on his campaigns, who advised him, have been such an integral part of the public image of, of John McCain in the final days and also retelling the stories uh, of him behind the scenes. Yes, and I'm surprised by that. I'm surprised mostly, uh, Rena, by the people who opposed him and write all of these hateful things and comments on YouTubes and tweets. <laughs> I've talked to some of those people, and, and uh, they'll be the first to acknowledge now that he, he was a great senator. And, uh, and they respect him for what he accomplished and what, what he did and who he was. One time former U.S. Navy pilot, he endured five and a half years as a prisoner of war in Vietnam, shot down over Hanoi. Very celebrated career on Capitol Hill, and as many of you know, earned himself the reputation as a political maverick. The state of Arizona right now says goodbye to their longtime senator as his body will head to Washington, D.C., to the nation's capital. Noticeably missing, Doug, um, the former presidential candidates, uh, former running mate, vice presidential uh, candidate at the time, Sarah Palin. Why is that? What was their relationship like after the, their run? You know, Rena, that's a very complicated story, but uh, uh, John McCain was not a perfect politician, and he, he went late into that campaign without securing his evangelical Christian base. You can see he attended an evangelical church and was a member of it for many, many years, had met with some of the leaders, but he waited too late to secure his base. And Barack Obama, who's a superb politician, spotted it. He launched what was called Operation Joshua that went right over the heads of the national media. They didn't understand it at all, but he was 
raiding McCain's evangelical Christian base, white voters. And the McCain campaign panicked. They tried a few things that backfired with a pastor from Ohio and Texas, got them in worse trouble because they were starting too late. And Sarah Palin was the perfect missing piece of the puzzle mm. that solved it. And there was about a week where the Obama campaign was stunned like a deer caught in the headlights, where, where they thought, oh, no, he figured it out. It's, uh, but uh, Sarah Palin imploded. She wasn't prepared for that moment. And she imploded, and it didn't work out. And I think this was McCain by not in having her invited to the, to the funeral. I, I think this was a tip to the national media uh, all his life. He leaned toward them on events and on decisions about Trump, even the same thing. I think this was him communicating that, yeah, I know I made a mistake here with Sarah Palin, and uh, uh, it, uh, it, is, it is what it is. And uh, he lost that campaign. It was a close campaign, but Sarah Palin solved it briefly, but she wasn't quite ready. Mm -hmm. So much of these next few days in the memorial in Washington, D.C., will have to do also about what he did not like about politics. And we know the president, President Trump, will not be invited. What was the message you think John McCain was trying to say with that? Well, I think that's obvious. Uh, again, uh, uh, he, uh, uh, they got into a feud. In fairness, it's not often covered, uh, John McCain shut off first. He said, they're crazies. He was embarrassed. Here were 10,000 people that showed up to greet Trump. It was right after Kate Steinle's murder. They showed up at the convention center in Phoenix, this big crowd. And uh, McCain was pulling 200 people at his town hall meeting. And here this outsider, <laughs> Trump pulls 10,000 people. So he called them crazies. But they were people from his own state of Arizona. So Trump fired back. I like I like my heroes that weren't captured. And so here went this public uh, uh, open feud, uh, embarrassing feud between the two. And uh, McCain has every right to decide who he wants to honor and why uh, in this celebration of his own life. And I think his message is uh, we've got to be inclusive. We've got to get along together. And I'm nobody's going to bully me. I yeah. think that, that's his message. Mm. We're seeing the live images right now of the McCain family on the tarmac there as the casket will be removed from the car and, and placed onto the plane to head to Washington, D.C. Uh, we were just looking at um, Megan McCain giving a hug to her sister Bridget on the far left. You know, it was just so hard to watch Megan McCain um, placing a kiss on the casket yesterday at the State House when the body arrived. Just the grief, uh, just so visible and, and hard to ignore, Doug. Yes, I think Megan McCain has done more. Uh, for her father to humanize him and to remind us that he's a dad and uh, that side of him uh, in the last few years, her appearances on TV, I think it's, it's had a big impact. And that has often been the case. That's the case with Jenna Bush, too, for George W. Bush. It, it's the case of Ivanka Trump. Uh, with Donald Trump uh, for many people. Uh, it, it's uh, people need to be reminded that these are human beings. And uh, of course, it changed everything with Abraham Lincoln when he lost Willie. Uh, he and his wife were just transformed and, and Abraham Lincoln uh, could understand uh, the many families who, who had experienced so much loss during the Civil War. All of that was changed by this personal experience. So I think I, when I see Megan, I, I think of someone that he was very proud of. You heard in the speeches that were given today, someone say, you watch, you watching Megan? I think it was Tony that he, he said, no, I don't watch TV. And, and Senator McCain said, you, you start watching TV and you watch Megan. He was proud of her. Wow. I want to now take us to the hearse here you see as a casket is being removed uh, here at Phoenix Sky Harbor Airport. Let's listen in.
Watching the final farewells as Arizona bids adieu to their longtime senator, 35 years in the Senate. Senator John McCain, his family and friends were joined by both state and local officials, even tribal officials, to bid farewell. At the services took place today at the North Phoenix Baptist Church. Arizona National Guard there retrieved the casket ahead of the processional. We know that the family, um, a great deal of planning went into this, and the senator, uh, in fact, weighed in heavily as to exactly how he wanted these five days of celebration of his life and the friends he kept and the career he led. The body will now head to Joint Base Andrews. We are expecting a, a very lively ceremony to take place Saturday morning at the National Cathedral. And ultimately, his final resting place will be in Annapolis, Maryland, at the Naval Academy. I want to listen in now.
You've been watching a send-off for Senator John McCain of Arizona. The body will now be carried on this airplane heading to Joint Base Andrews. I want to bring in our Jamie Yukas, who was outside of the memorial service outside of North Baptist Church, North Baptist, uh, excuse me, Phoenix Church. Uh, Jamie, what can you tell us? What was it like? I know it was very hot out there. What have you heard? Rena, there's just been an outpouring of love for the senator, as we heard within the memorial service with so many different friends and politicians, business leaders here in Arizona, but also in the crowd. Uh, we started the day down at the U.S. at the Arizona State House, where so many people had turned out. They wanted to hold flags. They also held signs from 2008 uh, when McCain ran for president. They were signs that said McCain on them. Uh, the motorcade came there. There was the National Guard uh, did a ceremony, brought the casket out from the state house put it in to the hearse that then came here to North Phoenix Baptist Church where that memorial service took place. Uh, so many wonderful speeches ended up happening today. Of course, uh, the biggest name of the group was Vice President Joe Biden. You also heard from his very close friend, uh, NFL wide receiver for the Arizona Cardinals, Larry Fitzgerald, who uh, at times was funny, and that was the majority of the speeches. Uh, at times they were very, very funny, and sometimes they were very, very serious. Uh, Larry Fitzgerald's speech really touched upon the fact that we should be embracing our differences, which could be seen in the crowd itself as well. Uh, there were 24 sitting U.S. senators who came to this memorial service here in Arizona today, 14 of them Republicans, 10 of them Democrats. And so it was just a wide range uh, and bipartisan kind of support here and audience uh, for this memorial service itself. I can tell you one of the things that struck us throughout the day today is just um, how tough this has been on the family. We heard from two of the children today. They gave uh, short readings within the ceremony of life as well, Bridget and Andrew, uh, both of John McCain's children. But as we've watched uh, from movement from place to place, you can see both uh, Megan McCain, his daughter, and his wife, Cindy McCain, now a widow, both very, very um, having a tough time with the emotions of all of this. As you said, it is very hot. Uh, it's in the hundreds, but I think that really speaks to Arizonans and wanting to come out and give this outpouring of love. Yesterday on Wednesday, people stood in in line at the state house for hours. Uh, there were 12 to 15,000 people, it's estimated, who turned out to see him lie in state. Rena. Just an amazing tribute today, Jamie, and the people who really just loved him from all walks of life. You, you talked a little bit about um, the folks outside. What have you heard from the people of Arizona and exactly what touched them most about his life? Well, I think what's really interesting is that if you look at the history of the state of Arizona, uh, Senator McCain was a senator for the state for a third of the state's history. Uh, he was in office for more than 30 years here in Arizona uh, as a senator. So many people here grew up only knowing John McCain as a senator for their state. Uh, there's just been an outpouring, as I said, of love. You've seen cards. You've seen uh, different mementos left at various places from uh, the funeral home where he was since Saturday to the State House, people leaving balloons. Uh, many of those cards and letters, I will tell you, uh, talk about his uh, legacy and, and having it just talk about what an upstanding individual he was and how they think his their children will look up uh, to Senator McCain and that they taught him uh, them all so much uh, about how to be a good person. Uh, some of John McCain's children actually came out into the rotunda after a short memorial service yesterday at the State House and were sharing different stories about their father. And what touched the children children uh, is that you could hear on some of the audio because there were cameras all around um, was that they kept saying your dad was a great man and the children would say well thank you for coming out we know that it's very hot okay. and they would say well of course we would do this um, because of the legacy of your father and that they were just so touched by him so it's one of those things that I think there's just been a tremendous outpouring of course Senator McCain was not born here in the state of Arizona but became very much uh, somebody that really exemplified what Arizona meant to the people here. Absolutely right, Jamie. About Arizona Department of Safety estimates that there were 12 to 15,000 members of the public who filed through the Capitol just on Wednesday alone. I want to thank our Jamie Yukas. We want to send you now with some moments from the memorial service at the Baptist Church just a short time ago. He understood all of us, whether it was white, black, brown, Asian. To him, it didn't make any difference. What he knew is that we all make America great. We all make America great. So I hope that in his legacy, the senators, governors, 
mayors, city council members, elected officials, embrace the thought of love, because John reflected love and love of a strong man. And that is nowadays hard to come by. He loved this place. And if John McCain fell in love with Arizona, Arizona fell in love with John McCain. We ran a lot of races here, a lot of elections. He never lost, never really very close. Arizona loved him. We're, we're going to miss so many things about him here in our state, his leadership here on these important issues.